Welcome back, everyone. You know, many music critics and music fans think this song, A Day in the Life, might be the best thing the Beatles ever recorded. I I wouldn't argue with that. We all know this song. You might have just heard the part toward the end there that of that first section, a strong, clear voice that does sort of a countdown that leads up to that orchestral crescendo. That voice belongs to one Mal Evans, a friend, confidant, collaborator, roadie, driver, bodyguard, and an essential, if unlikely, participant in the rise of and enduring popularity of the Beatles. That band is enjoying yet another resurgence 53 years after it broke up. Through Technical Magic, they just released a new song a few weeks ago. I played it last Sunday night. And they've reissued these remastered versions of the Red and Blue albums, which are selling like crazy all over again. Mal Evans was there for every step of the way, doing whatever needed to be done, enjoying life on the edges of stardom, and also yearning for something of his own. His story ends in tragedy, but there are a lot of laughs and also jaw-dropping moments along the way, put together by Evans himself and the meticulous notes he kept right from the beginning. Also, the memorabilia he saved in hopes of maybe publishing a memoir, one that never happened, but which has now emerged thanks to Beatles scholar, journalist Kenneth Womack, who's written a spellbinding book about the band and the man who supplied some of the glue that kept it all together, for a while anyway, Mal Evans. Ken joins me next on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. Kenneth Womack is one of the world's leading authorities on the Beatles and their enduring cultural influence. He's the author of a two-volume biography devoted to Beatles producer George Martin. Ken serves as a professor of English and popular music at Monmouth University. He's the editor of Interdisciplinary Library Studies. Over the years, he's shared his work with public libraries and community organizations across the country, as well as audiences at Princeton, Harvard, the Smithsonian, and he writes his own terrific website, Ken, welcome to Coast to Coast. Oh, so good to be with you. Thanks so much. I guess I should say welcome back. You were you were on the program a couple of years ago. That's right. It's uh, it's it's great to be back with you and your listeners. My gosh, I read this today. It's just a terrific book. It's so much fun to read it, and you must have had fun researching it and writing it. But from looking at your photo, Ken, I saw online, it looks like you're too young to have latched onto the Beatles during Beatlemania. Maybe I'm wrong. So tell me how you got hooked on the topic and the music and how it progressed from there. Oh, you are 100% correct. I am a second generation fan. Um, I discovered them in 1977. I would have been 11. And uh, they preempted my favorite show, which was this silly thing called the New Zoo Review. And I would uh, I would have my breakfast cereal and watch this anima, anamorphic thing. And Suddenly, the Beatles cartoons came on because my show had been canceled. And I got to tell you, I was mad. Uh, and the cartoons, of course, were so poorly written. But it was the music that got me. And I couldn't believe that I'd been missing these songs all these years. You teach at Monmouth. Uh, have you talked the school into letting you teach Beatles courses? <laughs> Not only have I, but it's a permanent part of the curriculum. Oh, so, wow. Um, I, in fact... Prior to coming to Monmouth, I taught uh, the Beatles at Penn State since 2002, um, and we have a course called Introducing the Beatles, where we talk about their career. Oh, my gosh. You've you've worked your way into quite a gig there. <laughs> <laughs> I am very, very fortunate. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, um, the, the funny thing about the Beatles course, though, is that uh, folks quickly discover that it is not a so-called blow-off class. Oh. You can actually fail it. Um, we're going to jump into the book right now. One more question first. Now and then, it gets released a couple of weeks ago. We played it on this program last night as a bumper tune. Give me your take on that. Uh, How are you as amazed as I am that it happened at all? I am absolutely uh, enthusiastic about it. Um, I was fortunate to go to a listening session that Apple held, uh, I guess, a few months back, and uh, I was blown away, and I still am. You know, uh, the power of the Beatles to move across generations and space and time is no surprise to me uh, at this point. It's, um, you know, it, it is, a, I guess it is the last Beatles song, but um, I, I don't know about you, but I think saying anything is the last with the Beatles is probably an error. Yeah. You know, they, they have centuries ahead of them as long as folks have ears and curiosity and wonderment, the Beatles are going to be right there. It is amazing to uh, hear young people who just discover it for the first time, you know, maybe from their parents or their grandparents or maybe by now great-grandparents and 
Uh, it just keeps cranking on. Mel Evans, um, I guess there are a lot of terms you could use to describe his role with the Beatles. I mean, he was a bouncer at the Cavern Club, then a bodyguard, roadie, gopher, driver, protector, procurer of whatever they needed, um, friend, companion. He became a music collaborator, uh, too. Um, part of the family, for sure. What word do you use that best fits? Gosh, um, you know, he was really, he would have said he was their friend um, the, and that he was uh, devoted to them. I mean, he was devoted to the cause. As I explained to my, my students when we talk about people like Mao, everybody needs a Mao. You know, the, when you look at any exemplary career, whether it's Charlotte Bronte, James Joyce, Picasso, there is at least one Mao, possibly multiple Mao's back there helping to make things happen because they're so devoted to the cause and the artist. And that's the case certainly here. He wasn't planning a book or obviously an eventual website or anything like that since they didn't exist when he started. But what set him on the path of recording notes and writing out, down all the details, the kind of things that you share with us in your book? So originally, Mao um, was a he was a telecommunications engineer with the British Post Office, the GPO, and every year they would provide him with uh, <laughs> an engineering diary, right? Just a giveaway for the folks who were in the union. And in 1963, he actually used it for the first time. He looked at it and started writing in it. And his idea was to keep track of his son Gary, who. Uh, at that point was uh, one and a half or so, and Mal was excited to capture, you know, the, the growth and development of Gary. He was fascinated by him. If you meet Gary today, you'd still be fascinated by him and want to keep a journal. He's, he is something. Um, and uh, that's what got it all started for him. It's just the Beatles happened to, within a, a few weeks, wind their way into that story, and, and Mal couldn't get enough of it. I think probably hardcore fans have looked forward to something like this for a long time. And, and Mal Evans wanted to write a book himself, but didn't for reasons that we'll get into. How did you uh, come to gain access to the underlying material? And uh, could you also tell the story of how that material was saved in the first place? Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, I didn't have any intention of writing about Mal. I knew about him uh, as anyone who works in this field would. And, and I knew about his essential nature and, and what was up, and I knew that he had died tragically. Um, right around the beginning of COVID, which we all shared together um, during lockdown, I was contacted by a mutual friend that said Gary Evans would like to talk to me. I take all comers. We got on Zoom, and uh, within minutes, I knew I would I would write his father's story. <laughs> he is really engaging, like like certainly his dad must have been. And uh, I, I couldn't help saying, is it true that there's all this stuff? And Gary said, yeah, you want to see it. <laughs> and so uh, the next thing I know, he's uh, posting it over here to New Jersey, to the Jersey Shore. And uh, in the midst of, of lockdown, my wife and I got this gigantic box with all these journals and photographs, thousands and thousands of them, you know, this, this massive material. And uh, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. You know, we're both quite devoted to the band story and learning new things as much and as often as possible. And suddenly here is all of this, this stuff, for lack of a better word. It was really, really quite something. Anyway, um, it's kind of amazing, as you alluded to a moment ago, that we even have it at all. Um, it should have, uh, by all rights, ended up and, and uh, <laughs> uh, it should have ended up in the, uh, in the trash bin. In fact, that was the plan. Uh, Mal had written his memoirs in 1975. Um, after his death, uh, the publisher, Grosset and Dunlop, spent years trying to figure out a way to publish them and, you know, make back their advance, essentially. Um, and eventually, when they couldn't figure that out, they just threw the whole lot in the storage room of, uh, of a great venerable building uh, nearby here in New York City, the New York Life Building. Um, <laughs> and uh, it stayed there for about 12 years. Um, and uh, if it hadn't been for an enterprising temporary worker who came in one day and found it and said, you can't throw this out. This is Beatles stuff. Uh, I don't think we would have it. In fact, she had to fight just to get it out of that basement and not into the trash bin. Um, and fortunately, what she did, being a, an enterprising immigrant, is she quit taking no for an answer. She wrote a little note up, walked uptown to the Dakota, and left it for the doorman 
uh, at that that famous that famous building. And uh, Yoko took matters into her own hands, uh, alerted uh, the Beatles' lawyers, and the next thing you know, the materials are back uh, belonging where they should have been, which is with the Evans estate. Oh, my gosh, that's just astonishing. And you get a box of this stuff sent to you, all these photos and priceless mementos and things that no one has ever seen, not since Mal Evans himself had it, and it arrives at your house. It'd be like somebody sending you a box of treasure from the Cheops Pyramid or something. Gosh, I I would think that would be overwhelming. Um, It really was, and it was overwhelming in the sense that it was a kind of an organizational challenge um, because Mal wrote, a few hundred thousand words just in manuscripts. Then there were all these diaries. There were um, uh, notebooks he would keep, which were fairly randomized. Um, Just a lot of material, and it really had not been organized. So fortunately, uh, in lockdown, I had several grad students in English who had plenty of time on their hands, uh, some undergraduates as well, and they they got to work transcribing the materials, uh, one undergraduate took all the photos uh, digitally and organized those, found out what was original, what wasn't, et cetera, started identifying people. And the next thing you know, we, we've got kind of an operation going. Wow. Uh, so introduce our audience to Mal Evans. Uh, you, you do have a great history about his family and his uh, upbringing and uh, living as a kid through World War II and, and how his family ends up living in Liverpool. Let's take take it up to where the point where he encounters the Cavern Club and starts hanging out there in uh, in his lunch breaks and then meets the Beatles. Sure. So um, Mal uh, was an Elvis fan, and of course the Beatles were notorious uh, and uh, avid Elvis fans, and that was their natural connection. And when he heard that music coming up from the Cavern Steps on one of his walkabouts around town. He had to go and explore it and uh, went down into the into the Cavern Club, which, of course, was this sweaty, uh, liver pugly, and uh, in this case, lunchtime affair. And there the Beatles were playing, and he got to know the band, especially George Harrison. And it was George's idea, knowing now, just like being down there on his lunch breaks, he said, why don't you get a job as a bouncer here? Then you can come for free, do whatever you want, meet the bands, hang out. And uh, that's exactly what Mal did. And Gary had just been born. This would have been late 61. And for him, it sounded like a source of a little extra money and and, and a welcome one at that. You tell the story in in Living the Beatles Legend, your book about Mal Evans, uh, that he starts spending more and more time there. His lunch breaks get longer. He's there after hours. He's a gigantic guy, huge hulking guy. If people have ever seen photos of him, this really big dude with uh, glasses that was always in the background of the, the Beatles events and traveling with them. And he looked like he'd be a really powerful, dangerous man to, uh, to who could handle himself as a bouncer, but he was kind of a sweetheart, right? He's kind of a, he's not a big tough guy, knuckle dragging type guy. No, he looked menacing, but he really was a pussycat. Um, and that was part of his charm is he just really was a, a lovable, cuddly kind of guy. Uh, but in a pinch, you know, he could scare folks away. I think he got into exactly one brawl on behalf of the Beatles uh, involving the media, of all things, uh, in at the Olympia Theater in, I guess it would have been January 64 in Paris. Uh, but other than that, he typically uh, ran from any kind of uh, physical engagement, although he would put his life and limb uh, in front of anything to protect the Beatles. As you note, I mean, in several instances, he's a really powerful guy. I mean, his strength is what impressed the Beatles in the early go, and he'd lift up these, I think you called it the coffin, this gigantic speaker that, that uh, Paul McCartney used. That's right. He, he really was quite powerful. And um, when, when the whole business started with the Beatles, he was quite fit. He was uh, uh, an avid swimmer, uh, bicyclist. He was very, very uh, physically imposing. And so, yeah, he could lift up that, uh, and, and impress people <laughs> quite so when he did it, he could lift up that coffin amp, uh, that for Paul's base, uh, single-handedly. And that would be pretty impressive for folks. You know, he looked like he was carrying around a toy, uh, when he would hold up Ringo's drum kit, that sort of thing. Part of what made him so imposing, uh, at six, three is that the Beatles were really pretty small. You know, they had these Press releases in the United States, I think it was in 64, that said that, what, three of them were five, 
five ten or five eleven. They were nothing of the sort. <laughs> and uh, oh. you know, so Mal looks like this hulking figure around him. Uh, and of course, he loved to photo bomb. If there were stars around, he wanted to meet them. If they were on tour and there was something new to see uh, in Rome or Denver, he wanted to be there front and center, taking it in for the first time. So he takes a job part time. He has his full time job with, in telecommunications. Takes a job part time as a bouncer at the club, and then uh, fate intervenes, and he gets asked if he'd like to drive the the Beatles to London. Uh, I guess Neil Aspinall got sick. And Mal, you want to fill in, right? Right. It was the defining moment. It was a kind of a primal moment for all of them, especially Ringo, who was a pretty new member of the band at that point. And um, uh, what happened was Neil got the flu. Please, please me is rushing up the charts, you know, sort of like their latest number one just uh, this last week or so. (laughs) And they needed to do uh, some PR and pretty hastily at that. So they headed down to London in the midst of the big freeze. And this was a serious, serious storm. There was ice going, you know, more than a mile out into the, uh, into the channel. So it was something fierce. Anyway, they went down there, but it was on the way back when the windscreen cracked, the windshield blew off, blew open rather, shattered. And uh, Mal drove them through the night while they, uh, four of them were in the back in a beetle sandwich with a big bottle of hooch. And he drove them through the night. And it was a bonding moment because as Mal was being punneled by wind and snow, et cetera, they would say, how far do we have to go, Mal? And he would say, <laughs> 200 miles to go, boy, <laughs> which was the distance, you know, between London and Liverpool. I think it probably still is. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this became their kind of mantra. And so when things would get tight, maybe in Manila uh, or during, you know, that crazy 1966 American tour, uh, they could be heard saying, how far to go, Mal? Uh, you know, for a little bit of reassurance. So there's something happened on the trip back through a rough weather. Again, it's really cold and the windshield cracks, right? That's right. And that's, uh, that was the defining moment. And it was, uh, it really connected them all. And actually the part that impressed Neil Aspinall the most was when, when Mal brought the van back, um, <laughs> he had had the windshield replaced uh, and nobody could figure out how Mal did that in such short order. Uh, but it was that kind of attention to detail that really enamored uh, the whole team, Brian Epstein included, uh, with Mal. He, he made it clear to them he was ready to do anything just to be in their presence and be part of the team. That's right. And, you know, he was a, he's a true believer. You know, he believed in their sound. He would rib them and say that, you know, they weren't Elvis. But, <laughs> uh, but he really was. He was a true believer. Um, and, you know, you can't pass that kind of dedication up. Uh, The Beatles had a very small entourage, really only a few people who worked with them. Brian Epstein, of course, wasn't going to be lifting coffin amplifiers or anything. So it was really just Mal and Neil against the world uh, for several years there. Uh, Amazing. Uh, When you realize what they were going through, uh, what's to come here. We're going to jump into that part of the story in a moment. Kenneth Womack is my guest, Living the Beatles Legend, the Untold Story of Mal Evans. We're going to the break with a song that uh, I think Mal is playing the tambourine in this, maybe, Dear Prudence. Kenneth Womack, uh, explain to me sort of the progression of Mal Evans's duties on behalf of the band. He starts as a bouncer in the Cavern Club, gets to know him, becomes their driver and then bodyguard. Uh, at, at some point, he decides to quit his very solid job and go on the road with the Beatles permanently. It must have been a pretty spooky decision to make for him. It was uh, a monumental decision to make if you think about it and you put yourself back in the context of 1963. I mean, here he is. He has a job that promises a pension. He's the first uh, person to be educated in his family. He's got a car, a mortgage. You know, he's doing all of the the solidly middle class things. He was socially mobile as far as the Evans family was concerned. And uh, this was a big deal to take a chance on a pop band. You know, there there was no it, there was no belief at all that a that a pop band would be anything. Eighteen months and out at best. Um, And this was a band that was on the rise. They'd had, by this point, Please Please Me and From Me to You when he had to make this decision. And they were shortly to release She Loves You, which, of course, was a game changer nationally in in the U.K. But um, this was a big deal, and and the family went into quite a bit of upheaval uh, over this issue. And it was really only his wife, Lily, who stood by him and uh, and championed his cause. Nobody else thought it was a good idea, and I'm, I'm sure even in his heart, Mal had his own misgivings. 
Describe for me uh, the clo- how close he became to the Beatles, because, I mean, it, it comes across in your book that they became pals. I mean, George Harrison is going to his house for dinner, and he's going to George's. He travels extensively with McCartney. He's buddies with Ringo. I think he's a little intimidated by John, but it seemed like he really was part of the family. He's traveling with them. He's eating meals, staying in the same hotels. He was like one of them. He was, and he he reveled in that. He you know drinks and meals for five <laughs> was his favorite phrase, because it, it meant he was one of the boys. You know, he grew up very awkwardly, even though he was athletic, as we talked about earlier. He's this big guy, really stood out. They called him Hippo when he was a kid, which you know he had to sort of in his mind make sense of. But uh, yeah, he he loved and adored the fact that they were that close. They were all bosom buddies for several years there as they traipsed around the world trying to consolidate their fame. Um, and those relationships were very important to him. Now, there was a flip side, right? I mean, the Beatles would call Mal and Neil Aspinall every name in the book. You know, they had to be there for all the rough stuff, too. And uh, these tours were by, by no means easy. And he's not making a ton of money. In fact, you know, it's pretty paltry when you look at it. Well, it's paltry compared to, say, what the Beatles were making. You know, they're making $6,000 a week or 6,000 pounds a week or whatever. And he, he's making 40 or 50 pounds. Um, when Brian Epstein, Epstein set everything up, though, he made sure Mal and Neil were getting way better than scale. In fact, um, at least in those initial years before inflation took too big a bite out of their money, Mal and Neil were doing really well, you know, in terms of you know, the population. Uh, describe the progression of his duties for them. So driver, bodyguard, I mean, he, they became really dependent on him uh, to a large extent, not just to move the equipment, but to protect them, to get them from A to B, to, uh, from the venues to hotels, and, and then a whole bunch of other duties that develop later. Sure, and Mal was kind of a fixer. You know, um, one one of uh, John Lennon's assistants told me that John boasted that Mal knew every police chief in every city in the world. You know, he knew how to, to keep things moving, which is essential in a, you know, a sort of a movable feast of a rock circus like that. Um, he was he was essential uh, in that fashion. Um, but, you know, over the years, anything that was needed, uh, you know, that was Mal's job. Uh, Mal, uh, after they discovered marijuana with Bob Dylan in August 1964, that was the job, you know. Um, they, he and he and Neil devised a plan by, via which they would take cigarette cartons, get rid of all the tobacco, put in the weed, uh, reseal with cellophane the cartons um, like they did in those days, and um, away they'd go. They could move those through any country for the Beatles so they'd have their ready supply. Whatever they needed, Mal did. You described – maintain... oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go, no, I, I, I was – you were on a great tra- track. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. I just, uh, you know, when we, and we're doing our Beatles class right now here at Mammoth, and we're getting into those great late albums. In fact, tomorrow night is the White Album, so it's a big moment that all the students have been looking forward to. And that's when you can really see Mal in those post-touring years shine. You know, he's the reason they can stay up late working on a new track, or uh, he knows how to go wake up the person at the instrument store at 4 a.m. and say, John needs a new guitar, <laughs> you know, so... Mal was that guy, all jobs, uh, and no questions. They they came to abuse him a little bit. You you have a section in the book where John Lennon calls at 3 a.m. and just says apples yeah. or socks. They, they do a little bit. Uh, I, I think that came with the job, though. You know, he signed up for that. He was there to serve their cause, and whatever that meant, uh, Mal was willing to do. Um, he would sometimes um, sacrifice his own ego if they were fighting amongst themselves he would get them to turn their ire onto him so that uh, they could work out whatever they were doing and, and, and move forward. He, he loved being around celebrities, rubbing elbows with the people who uh, came to meet the Beatles as they became bigger and bigger. He loved that stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, he did love it. Um, he was pretty starstruck. He's a little older than they are. He was five years older than John and Ringo, who were the oldest members of the band. Ringo still is. Hope he maintains that for decades. Um, but Mal, Mal was older. He knew all the old movies. He was really tuned into uh, Hollywood culture, for example. Uh, he was a big reader. So all of this was like seeing, 
you know, his celluloid dreams come to life when they would run around the world. You know, suddenly there's Burt Lancaster or Frank Sinatra or, or whomever. And uh, Mao had developed a great gift of gab. So he was also useful to them uh, when they would have these kinds of celebrity encounters because he could go and hang out with them, have a drink, talk to them, and maybe give the Beatles a break from having to be on all the time. When Beatlemania hits, uh, they become these international stars on a scale we can't even imagine. Suddenly, uh, women, girls, start throwing themselves at, at the, the band members. And in order to get to the band members, they do the same to the guys who are in the entourage, Bal and Neil, right? That's right. And uh, <laughs> there's no doubt that uh, plenty of things went down there. Um, what, what really blew Mal away was that uh, often the young women would be accompanied by their mothers. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was, you know, it developed into these kind of awkward situations. And sometimes Mal had to be the guy who turned away the women and got them out of there uh, before scandal might break out. Well, Las Vegas, for example, they came to Las Vegas. I've written about this. Uh, I've talked to, to people who are around, um, you know, and uh, written, written the stories about their uh, their concert stop here in Las Vegas. And I knew that they had stayed at the Sahara and uh, heard some general stories about what had happened behind the scenes, how they had slot machines in their hotel room because they couldn't go down to the casino. But uh, there are some stories that you tell in this book that I had not heard before about scandals that were narrowly averted. Sure. Um, young women shuttling around in elevators and, and this sort of thing um, and uh, worried parents, etc. Uh, it turns out possibly worried about nothing. But, um, you know, the Beatles really uh, were very fortunate. Um, now, they're no Led Zeppelin or The Who or some of these stories you'll hear about the 70s. It certainly was never of that level, uh, particularly in the case of Led Zeppelin, of lewdness. Um, but you know, the Beatles were, there were, there were lots of comers, people coming for them all the time. And it would, it was creating all sorts of hazards. They're young guys. Uh, Mal has never seen, uh, people offer themselves in this way up so easily. Um, it was a strange place. Larry Kane, whom you probably have uh, spoken to in the past, is particularly eloquent on this about how this circus-like atmosphere really kind of wrecks your psyche. You know, you start behaving in ways you might not normally, and uh, they they started finding themselves sort of going down this this road of the bacchanal. Um, John Lennon especially found it, uh, you know, thrilling on the one hand, but really dangerous on the other. Yeah. Uh, so Mal Evans, uh, uh, you know, he's he had some musical aspirations of his own at some point. It never really spoke about it until later in the book, but you know, he, he clearly had some thoughts that maybe he'd like to be a star at some point as well. And they, he actually collaborates with the Beatles on a number of songs. We've played a couple of them here where he's, he's helping to perform or add to the sound on, on a couple of them. And I know he, there must be a longer list that you'd be aware of. He's also in their movies, right? That's right. You know, Mal was handy. Uh, in fact, that's the word Paul McCartney would often use. It was handy to have Mal around. He, you know, if you, you're in the middle of the night and you need somebody to hold down an organ note, there he is. Play the maracas, the harmonica. Um, you know, count out the measures as you played earlier in A Day in the Life. <laughs> he plays the alarm clock on that song. He's even there at the end banging the, the gigantic piano chord, you know. He, uh, he was there, available, competent. And, uh, you know, they had such a small group that they could trust. Um, they're putting out so much music, and their spark, their artistic spark, is just unmatched during that period. So to keep the train, you know, moving forward with all of that great momentum, they might call on Mal or other folks who were part of that small entourage to come up with a lyric or uh, to participate or collaborate in some fashion. It was just a a highly energetic space, uh, and Mal was, uh, like I said, he was a pretty well-read guy, pretty plugged in in terms of culture, and uh, he was there in a pinch, and they knew to take advantage of that. He does the hammer on an anvil in Maxwell Silver, Silver Hammer. That's him, right? <laughs> it isn't on the final recording. He actually wow. was uh, in a work stoppage. We could discuss later if you want, but sure. he plays it at Twickenham Studios uh, during the Get Back sessions in January 69. The really interesting part is not just that he plays the anvil, but that he knew how to go get one. 
<laughs> you know, Paul said, I need a, a hammer and an anvil, <laughs> almost like an afterthought. And uh, Mal whips out his Rolodex, which he kept with him everywhere. And he had, he knew that there was a theatrical props, prop shop somewhere around there, a uh, store. And he went over and talked them into giving them his anvil. <laughs> and that's how that came about. So he's taking notes every step of the way on this stuff. Uh, t- describe how accurate it is, how useful it is. I know you said it needed a lot of organization, uh, but h- how good were, were the notes? How accurate? Wow, they're uh, stupendously accurate. You know, I mean, um, as you know, scholars know, the most important uh, information you can get is contemporaneous. And here's Mal uh, taking notes and saving receipts and documents and uh writing up his thoughts, for example, after meeting Elvis, you know, at length. So um, he was, it's incredibly valuable and vital kinds of information because it's firsthand and it's happening in the moment. So, you know, it, it tends to presuppose some of the other sort of excavation that uh, Beatles scholars have had to do over the years to try to figure out what happened. You know, and there's Mal mo- telling us in real time exactly what transpired. He's taking photos, too, right? He took lots of photos. Yeah, the Beatles, you know, these young guys were excited by gadgets. And so they would get the latest and the greatest in terms of still and moving cameras. And uh, as they did, they would pass on the other ones to Mal. And, um, in fact, they encouraged him to take photos because, you know, somebody needed to document this strange thing that was taking place. They all recognized that it was, you know— really big and, and uh, otherworldly, this kind of fame they were experiencing. And that kind of fell on the shoulders of Mal. It was George Harrison who said, look, you know, <laughs> you know, we only pay you a certain amount. If you want to sell photos, we don't care. And he did a few times to magazines like, I believe, 16 Magazine in the United States. But, um, yeah, they absolutely encouraged him to take photos. He went from being kind of an okay photographer uh, sometimes with maybe a finger in front of the lens, uh, a little shaky to pretty competent. And of course, sometimes he's the only person there to document something uh, photographically. Can you imagine what his level of access would have been, would be worth today if the Beatles were at their height now? I mean, you know, just a, a, a tip <laughs> here or there where they were going to stay or uh, who they were with or a photo or two. My gosh. Yeah. I mean, you know, Mal probably would never have allowed himself to exploit them in that way. But you're right. I mean, it would be worth a fortune. Um, He was very careful, uh, particularly as Beatlemania uh, became more omnipresent, even even a little violent and dangerous in 65 and 66. He was so concerned about their safety. You know, there there was a lot of frivolity in 1964. You mentioned Las Vegas, but less so by the time they get to 65 and 66. I mean, they are um, as you suggested, they're they're pinned up in, in hotel rooms. They really aren't seeing any of the cities they go to. Uh, there's a there's a lot of danger. I mean, a lot of cities, uh, their police forces aren't really coming out in mass. You know, they might send two constables when they needed to send two hundred. You know, yeah. uh, to help protect them. So it was pretty harrowing. But um, you know, a- absolutely, Mao was essential in in keeping that that train moving forward. And, of course, there was racial strife in the U.S. Uh, during the, the tours and, uh, you know, uh, uh, segregation that, that made the band uncomfortable. There was the John Lennon's infamous comment about being more popular than Jesus, that people were started to burn their records. I mean, there was a lot of risky situations they got themselves into. They really did, and, and John would call that the Jesus Christ tour in 1966, which would be the last Beatles tour. Um, and it did get pretty harrowing. You know, there was, at one point they were in Memphis and somebody threw firecrackers on the stage, you know, and they thought, which one of us has been shot, right? Uh, or, you know, the, the KKK would march outside of, you know, their concerts. It was really getting out of hand. And, and they knew better. They knew that the better work that they were doing was always going to be in the studio, Um as opposed to those circus-like concerts. They'd really begun to have enough, but it, it truly was dangerous, and, and Mal recognized that he was outnumbered in terms of trying to protect them. I, I can imagine, you know, fans were disappointed that they stopped touring, but it was obviously a good decision on their part. They could concentrate on producing really great records, and, uh, you know, they, they're performing in these concerts and can't even hear themselves, and nobody in the audience can hear them play either, so 
Don't blame them for that. We're talking with Kenneth Womack about his terrific book about Mal Evans, uh, Living the Beatles Legend. When we come back, we're going to get into uh, the creative input um, that Mal Evans uh, gave to the band, uh, Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, among others, and then a tragic ending, uh, just an unbelievable story. We'll be right back with more 